few people here of contrast training. And I, I think that's something that's kind of came up. And it's that idea of really looking at like post-activation potentiation and being able to couple those properly with intensities. I think a lot of the, the stuff that you're going to read out there online is a little bit wrong, where I don't think you need to be working in the 95% of your strength work, especially with one of these fights. I think you're going to get some trouble. But I think if we can hover that 80 to 85% range for a good quality two to five reps in terms of our strength work, I think if we couple that with a contrast movement that is adequate for their for their weaknesses or deficiencies, that's another thing where I think when you look at this post-activation potentiation idea of contrast training, and essentially people are listening and they don't know what the hell I'm talking about, some do, you're essentially taking, let's just say something that you've seen a million times, a squat with a box jump, right? We take something that's a heavy loaded, you know, exercise and we couple it with a non-loaded power type exercise. And, and we use a lot of those for the idea that I think I can get, I can get more for less. I don't need to load them up. Like you said, with 500 pounds in a split squat, what can I do? I can take something like a deadlift and I can work them at about 80 to 85% for fast, safe, stable, strong movements yep. that I know aren't going to hinder their performance later, but are still going to get the activation, the fire and the strength. And then I can couple those with a contrast type movement. And I think this is where people lose the concept of this idea where they've seen something like a squat and a box jump. But why do you choose a box jump? And that's the question. You know, I think people don't realize there's two aspects of this. There's a rate of force development aspect where, an, athlete, where an athlete's deficient at their force development and rate. But that's not always the case. Sometimes when you look at it, it's really just the elasticity component or basically the, the plyometric component, energy storage component that they're deficient at. Two very different things. So when you're looking at what that contrast might be, you need to identify is that rate of force development where this athlete's deficient and we need to enhance or is it the elasticity component? Mm -hmm. And again, easy way to do that. Let's just do a, let's do a dead, a non-counter movement vert a counter movement vert, and then let's do some form of depth jump that, invo that involves lowering the center of mass and, and sort of gaining that, you know, external force and being able to absorb that. And I think that's where people sort of mess up with this, where they're not getting the most efficient use of this contrast for their athlete. So like when I know somebody like Kamaru, for instance, his elasticity is super high. His rate of force development is where he, and again, doesn't lack compared to most people, he's still in the top. 99 percentile but that's compared to the 100 percentile so that's sort of the the missing link that we are trying to enhance so if we're looking at something like rate of force development and we're looking at a deadlift we're going to do something from a standstill position where he's in a dead position maybe like in a, a banded rdl where we're at a complete dead movement and it's a pop through mm -hmm. now let's say on the contrary if it was something where he's where he's missing the elasticity component, that's where we would do something like a kettlebell swing that involves that elastic component, that energy storage, that, you know, really those three aspects of eccentric, amortization, concentric of the, of the plyometric chain. So I think being able to identify where those weaknesses are in the athlete can really take away from what you said, the, the fear and the thought of having to build that strength with, a loaded single leg squat if we can couple those movements together in the right way we're probably going to get more and again i think a lot of this is sort of i think some of this has been supported in research literature i think some of it has been theorized but again i think it goes hand in hand what are we doing in a combination like this you know we're looking at an increase in synap synaptic excitation we're probably looking at more motor activation we're probably looking at things on the myelin sheath that in terms of adaptation, in terms of what we would see with just basic strength training and increased muscle, we'd have to be seeing on this neurological, mm -hmm. this neurological component and aspect. So I think it's just, you know, a little long winded there, but again, it kills me when I see what you said, seeing somebody load up at 500 pounds, doing a single leg for this, that, and the other, how does that apply? And how does that carry over to your sport? That is a highly powerful rotational sport high velocity like it just doesn't have the carryover and you're gonna fuck up your training for the next two or three days yeah.